the disclosure, full disclosure, for the next decade, there is only one certainty in this world. Peter Marcos will be here leading this conf the, 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 the 41 uh, uh, still success strategies conference. Other than that, we don't know anything about it, but we'll try to figure out. So that's the goal this morning. So let's start with the map. That's what I finished last year. So it starts with the two uh, countries that are most influential in terms of what's going on right now. One is Australia, the other one is China. China is, is still very focused on keeping employment at all costs, keeping 1.4 billion people quiet, calm, and not fighting inside, is still uh, 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 rowing ahead peacefully, and employment is key. So they found a big enabler in Australia, sending them artificially cheap iron ore. This day is coming to an end, and things are starting to change when the two majors that, by the way, control this commodity. This is not your, your usual commodity. This is not coal. This is not pork bellies. This is not soybeans. This is iron ore. Three companies, Vale from Brazil, Rio Tinto from Australia, and BHP from Australia, they, together, they are more or less into the 800 million tons a year level. So they can do whatever they want with the commodity. And until last year, they were uh, destroying prices on purpose. This thing is changing. But that's the, the, the picture at this point. Cheap iron ore feeding China, enabling an efficient capacity. Capacity that should be long gone is still be operational because it helps keep employment. And what happens next? Dump and steal. You add subsidies, you add government interference, all kinds of uh, facilitations to produce and keep producing, exporting and keeping exporting. And a big majority comes uh, to the United States, to Europe, disrupts the markets in, in Japan and South Korea, and make these countries also to become exporters against their own will. But I would be remiss if I would not mention Vale from Brazil. Vale is the biggest uh, producer of iron ore, or will, will reclaim their, their role as the biggest producer of iron ore as S11D, the Serra Sul Carajás, starts operation this year with a nameplate nominal capacity of 90 million tons a year of 66% iron content. So Vale could, could have been doing a much, a much better job in terms of keeping this market under control. But they elected not to. I hope that they are changing directions. Uh, I'm still a, a, a person of a lot of hope in my heart. So I believe that the right truth will prevail and the right things will be done. But that's the picture. That's why we have uh, a dump of steel. Now let's talk about what we call the unlevel playing field real quick. This is not be the core of my, of my presentation, but we need to address why the, the playing field is so uneven. Main reason, the, China is still pro, uh, the Chinese steel production hurts the environment. Not the Chinese environment, but the world environment. The production of steel in China is basically sinter based That's sinter feed fines of iron ore. It's not the, a mountain in the Himalayas. This is just a, a pile of sinter feed fines sitting at the port in China. Sinter feed fines doesn't go inside blast furnace. Sinter feed fines feed sinter plants. This is a sinter plant. But you see a lot of black smoke going out of the sinter plant. And the sinter feeds the blast furnace. You probably, in the back, you guys can't see the blast furnace. Yeah, it's hiding behind pollution. That's the blast furnace over there. <laughs> Just to make sure you see the blast furnace. We don't use that here. We don't use that in Europe. We don't use that in the first world. So we can't talk about China being a market economy. We can't talk about a level playing field when this is the steel that China is sending to the world. So it's funny when my... Friends in California, they buy stuff made in China, believing that they are protecting the environment and driving a Toyota Prius. And uh, they believe that they are doing a good thing, pushing manufacturing into China. 
until they fix this, there's no way we are going to allow them to be market economy. So anyway, the Chinese is exporting dump the steel and pollution to the world. A lot of the problem for the next generations in terms of the carbon footprint, in terms of uh, uh, pollution itself in general with PM 2.5 is coming from China. That's a fact. Breathing in Beijing is equivalent to smoking 40 cigarettes a day, like I used to do until I was 39 years old. And uh, if I had continued, I would not be here today. So thanks God I came to California. It was in 1998, a place that was impossible to smoke. and ended up quitting. And, uh, but anyway, if we were in Beijing, I would still be, still be doing that, even though I'm not smoking anymore. So, and we'll talk about PM 2.5. This is the, the, the particles that are smaller than 2.5 microns. They are so small that they go deep inside the lung. And from the lung, they go into the bloodstream. So PM 2.5 kills. So in any given day, and this is just a, a picture of one day, uh, that's December 13, 2015, but could be any given day, that's the, the map of PM 2.5 in China and South Korea and in Japan. So you'll see that in Japan, it's almost all green. And green is good, green is clean, except for the small industrial region around Osaka. That's a very heavily industrialized area of Japan. The, the rim around Tokyo Bay, including Tokyo, Oklahoma, and, Ch and, and Chiba, and small portions in south of Kyushu, the southern island, and the north of uh, Hokkaido, the big island of Japan, you have yellow, but yellow is still good. Yellow is, is moderate. So green and yellow, that's great. So a very industrialized country, very homogeneous, complies with the environment. Now fast forward to China. Look at the situation around Beijing, in the Hebei province, in the, Li the, the Liaoning province, around Harbin in the northeast, close to Siberia and North Korea. These are areas that are between purple and brown. That's when human beings cannot even breathe, cannot even live. Theoretically, they should wear uh, gas masks all day long in order to continue to be alive. So the situation is dramatic. Why it's not being addressed? Because we have other more urgent things to be concerned about and a lot of distractions that are put in front of us. But that's a big problem. If you are a responsible person in our business, you need to know these things, because if you don't know, if you continue to pretend that you ignore these things, you, the next generations will pay. So good news is that the Chinese government is clearly stating in their new 13th five-year plan, 2016-2020, that they are going to reduce 45% in energy intensity by 2020. I believe it. I saw that happen myself in Taiwan when working for CSN in Brazil. I was selling Brazilian steel in Taiwan. I started going there in 1989. The air was horrible. I stopped going there in 1993. It was completely clean. And what happened in Taiwan between that short time frame, it's the same thing that happened in South Korea 10 years before, and in Japan during the late 60s and early 70s. So China will resolve their environmental problem. They will. They will because that's the, the right thing to do for the Chinese people and for the world. They have already made the decision. And when they make the decision, they will execute. So, if this is the situation today, that will be the situation in the future. And they will do that without using what I used here. I used Photoshop. <laughs> so the pollution problem will lead to a major change in how the Chinese steel industry operates in the next 10 years. 
Again, a picture of what goes on right now. China is heavily reliant on iron ore imports from both Australia and Brazil. In 2014, China imported 933 million metric tons, and in 2015, 953 million metric tons imported. 2015, Australia was 64%, Brazil was 20%. So 84% are basically four companies, BHP, Rio Tinto, Vale, and Fortescue. Just to give you the, the numbers for you to keep in mind how these things work. Vale is in the 350 million tons a year, as well as Rio Tinto. BHP is in the 250, 250 million tons a year. Fortescue is 165 million ton, tons a year. Our Australian division, Cliffs APIO, Asia Pacific Iron Ore, is 12 million tons, and we're number four in Australia. So 350, 250, 165, 12 is number four. So it's totally 100% concentrated. So, with that, this thing needs to change. So there are passes to resolve the problem. One would be what we use here in the United States, iron ore pellets. That's what we use. That's what Europe uses, and other first world steel makers. The other avenue, electric furnaces. We also use that here in the United States and has become very popular in other places of the world. The problem with iron ore pellets is very simple. is the scarcity of water in the Pilbara region of Australia. The Pilbara region is a desert. In order to produce pellets, you need basically two things, iron ore and water. That's the reason we produce pellets in Minnesota, because we have both iron ore and water. In Australia, they do have iron ore, they do not have water. They are an island, they can bring water from the sea, but then they, ha they need to remove the salt and things like that. It will be very difficult to claim uh, we are the low cost producer when you have to take salt off, out of the water. So that's not going to happen. So if this is an avenue that takes you to a cul de sac, the other avenue is the electric furnace. Electric furnace, you need basically two things. You need scrap, and you need electricity. And China will have a lot of scrap. The Chinese reservoir of scrap will make the United States look like a very little uh, place in terms of scrap. That's the future. That's what is happening uh, in front of our, our eyes. So the shift in China toward electric furnaces will create enormous effects across the iron ore and the scrap sectors. Demand for Australian and Brazilian iron ore will be reduced because uh, it's clear that the Chinese steel industry will not continue to grow indefinitely. I, I believe that China will keep a very high production number for their own consumption as they move from fixed assets investments to a more uh, mature and more stable consumer-driven consumer economy. But growth will not be there. And that will change as electric furnaces are replaced, I'm sorry, blast furnaces are replaced, replaced with uh, uh, EAFs. Blast furnace BOFs are replaced with the EAF route. So demand for Australian and Brazilian iron ore will be reduced. Then, of course, the Chinese demand for scrap in the first moment will, will increase. But the entire scrap system is not fully developed in China yet. Not yet. It will be. But it's not developed yet. The scrap is a complex issue in terms of collection, uh, processing, distribution. It's not as simple as it looks like. It looks simple in a country like ours. But it's not that simple when you don't have it or you don't have the infrastructure to move scrap in a timely basis and the right scrap at the right moment. So we are going to have a moment that we are going to have blast furnaces going down, EAFs going up, the need for scrap 
and no scrap available yet. That will have a major impact in the country that has the vast majority of available scrap to be traded, and that's the United States. Because China will, at that moment, import a lot of scrap. And the American steel market for scrap will be squeezed because scrap will follow where the demand is, where the good prices are, where the volumes are uh, growing, and that will leave our EAFs in a very difficult spot if they only depend on scrap. So the US EAF market will require a lot more of iron substitutes. We call loosely DRI, but could be HBI. In our case, cliffs will be HBI and could be even pig iron. But we are going to have a moment in this market here in the United States when the scrap will be expensively, expensive and eventually unavailable. And that's when iron substitute, substitutes will become the most important thing. So the window of opportunity for iron substitutes in the United States is the next decade. During the time when we will see EAFs going up, scrap being talked about in China, but not easily available, not easily movable around, but the EAFs are there and they need to be fed and the government will be cracking down on pollution and improving the environment. big opportunity in the next decade. Well, these things in our business, they don't happen very often. The last time that I can recall was here in the United States when a visionary named Ken Iverson noticed that we had a lot of scrap in the United States, but the scrap was only being used to feed EAF producing long products. So if we could use more scrap, to produce flat rolled products, that would have been a good thing. Technology was available as much as the DRI HBI technology is available today. We heard a lot from Midrax and from Tenova uh, uh, to, uh, today and yesterday. So we know that the technology is available the same way that things lab caster technology was available from SMS. But it took a guy like Ken Iverson to really push to implement the first one that was 19, in 1989, Nuke or Crawford's with the first thing is live caster in our country to produce flat rolls. And then after the first one, the first one is the difficult one. After the first one, the next one and the next one and the next one come fast. How fast? Fast like this. In 1993, Nuke or Hickman started with two casters, and Crawfordsville put the second caster. At the same, in the same year, 1993, the then general manager of Nucor Crawfordsville, my friend Keith Bussey, left Nucor with two of his friends, Mark Millet and Dick Teets, to initiate the steel dynamics. And the steel dynamics started in 1995. After that, it was all growth. Since 2005, more than 50% of the U.S. crude steel pro produced is produced via EAF. Situation right now is what you see on the right side of this picture. 37% via blast furnace BOF, 63% EAF. In, during the 80s, when we were just long products, it was the opposite, 36% EAF, 64% blast furnace VOF. It all started with Crawfordsville, 1989, Ken Ivers, SMS. SMS didn't push, Ken did. So, how can Cliffs benefit from this entire thing? Like this. First, China begins a serious crackdown on pollution. It's starting, it's at the very beginning. It's not so easy to see at this point, but it's happening as we speak. And it will take uh, uh, speed very quickly. Keep in mind, it's part of the 2016-2020 plan. 
and the president of China, the, 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 the big shot, wants this done. It's going to happen. I have seen, personally, uh, him talking about. That's impressive. We don't see that happen even in very green countries like the United States. We haven't seen President Obama or any of his predecessors talking about what's going to happen with the manufacturing bases of the country as far as pollution. We see a lot of uh, stuff related to unimportant things related to the environment, but not a major overhaul in terms of how things are done. And in China, that's the way they are planning to do. Second, the government in, in China will invest in energy and natural gas infrastructure. It's also starting. So it's not like something that we are seeing from uh, uh, reading stuff that's not available for us to read. It's right there. It's happening right now. Next, EAFs rapidly gain market share from blast funds. Why rapidly? Because it's China. They build fast and they build right. They don't take too much time to do what's right. Next, Australia will have nowhere to sell the massive amounts of seaborne fines that they will sell. And they will have no option other than selling less for a higher price, making more money than they make today, but then they can't defend the market share. They can't pay their shareholders with market share. They have to pay their shareholders with return on investment, with EBITDA, things like that. So market share is not a goal in itself. So that will help Australia as well. Next, the global scrap market will tighten a lot. Because like I said, the very first thing is not to create a, a beautiful system to collect and distribute the scrap in China, is to get scrap. And the easiest way to get scrap is showing the money, importing scrap into China, and using the scrap that were supposed to be destined to the EAFs here in the United States. So that will make the scrap prices here to increase. Not next week. Not tomorrow, but in the next decade. The scrap will be sometime during the next few years into the next decade. The scrap will be a very, very expensive commodity. What about us, cliffs? American steelmakers' demand for alternative iron ore units will increase because no scrap, because they want to address more sophisticated markets, including automotive, they need Iron, iron substitutes. Investment in the alternative iron unit infrastructure will expand in the United States. And like I said before, I will repeat one more time, it only takes the first plant in the Great Lakes and then we can populate the Great Lakes with a lot of DRI and HBI. Keep in mind the preconditions are here. Vist Alpine put a plant in Corpus Christi, Texas so in the Gulf of Mexico, ready to, to, to get seaborne pellets because my predecessors at Cliffs never really recognized that market as a market for Cliffs. So that's probably one of the reasons Nucor is in Louisiana and, and, uh, and Trinidad and uh, uh, Vista Alpine is in Corpus Christi because Cliffs was not interested and we are in the Great Lakes. Okay, fast forward, we are very interested in DRI, HBI, in the Great Lakes. Vista Alpine put that plant over there primarily to supply HBI to their integrated mills, to their blast furnaces in Liz and Donovitz. All is ahead of the curve, Vista Alpine. They load a lot of HBI into their blast furnaces and they're planning to load a lot more in order to continue to comply with more and more strict environmental uh, regulations in Europe. So it's going to happen here as well. So I'm talking HBI to EAFs because it's a natural first step. But HBI will be well adopted into blast furnaces as well for the same reason, environmental regulations. Cliffs will continue to supply their grade pellets and or alternative iron units. The grade pellets we are supplying right now. We're a proud supplier of the only active producer of DRI in the country. But we are um, uh, not really selling into a market that we're designed to sell. Cliffs Mines and Cliffs Infrastructure is designed to operate within the Great Lakes. 
And that's where I would like to have our DRI HBI production. And I say that we will supply DR grade pellets to someone or the alternative our units it's themselves because if it, nobody does, we will do ourselves. Next, the use of alternative iron units enables American electric arc furnace to supply more sophisticated specs of steel. And I would say that even to continue to supply the good stuff that they supply, because over time, scrap deteriorates. So we are seeing the deterioration of the quality of scrap in the United States. It would be great for China, no doubt about it, but it's no longer that great for us. So alternative iron units also uh, assures the, ensures the, the continuity of the EAF strong industry that we have today in the country. And last but not least, Cliffs will become the go-to raw material supplier in North America for both the BOF blast furnace route as we have today and also for the EAFs. A few conclusions. First one. The current serious environmental problem in China will be resolved by the Chinese because it's the right thing to do, because the government in China has already recognized that, and because the Chinese government wants to do the right thing at the end of the day. Second, like in the United States 30 years ago, China will have enough scrap to support a big move toward EAFs. That's for sure. China will be the biggest uh, uh, scrap mine in the world, the big scrap reservoir, like Peter Marcus likes to say. However, the domestic scrap supply chain in China will have to be built because it doesn't exist yet. And that will take a decade or so, 10 years or so, in the meantime, during the next 10 years, we'll have a big window of opportunity for iron substitutes in the United States. We only need two things. Like at Crawfordsville 1989, we need the technology and the will to do it. Now we have the technology, the iron ore, and the will to do it. Cliffs will do it. We are gonna have a lot of DRI, HBI in the Great Lakes in the next five to 10 years. With that, I will stop and I'll be glad to entertain your questions. If I could try one, please, L L Lorenzo. Uh, it appears that the operating, the center fee delivered to the port by the major iron ore companies is maybe $16, $17 per ton. So how can you compete with this low cost and what have you been doing to bring down your cost since you've taken over the company? Well, the 16, 15, 17 or nine come from S11D, it's just a number, a number that doesn't include a lot of things. Uh, just to compare bananas with bananas, to compare the Sinterfeed finds that we're talking about with the Sinterfeed finds that we produce in Australia, our uh, comparable cost is 26. But now let me start to, to skin the cat layer by layer. Our ore in Australia is 50% fines, 50% lump. BHP has only 20% lump. Rio Tinto has 25 to 30% lump. Fortescue has 0% zero, zero lump. Because of our lump, uh, high lump percentage, our biggest client in Asia is POSCO. It's not in China, it's in South Korea. And because of our, our high uh, uh, percentage of lump and uh, the consistency of our quality, out of, out of Kulianobin, in the yield garden in Australia, we have, out of 11.7 million tons a year, more business in Japan than Fortescue with 165 million tons. So these numbers are, they don't tell the entire story. So S11D from Valley 
that may come with a cost in the single digits will produce 66% iron content. There is no market for 90 million tons of 66% iron content. Impossible. It's like telling that uh, uh, everyone that eats red meat will go to Morton's every day. No. They will go to the grocery store and they will, go, they will, they will buy uh, raw ground beef. So that's the way it works. So these numbers don't say a thing. At the end of the day, the, among the three companies, Vale, BHP, and Rio Tinto, last year they destroyed 290 billion, with a B, US dollars in market cap, and it was an, an act of self-destruction. So much so that the changes had already started in both Rio Tinto and BHP. So forget about these numbers, just numbers. They don't reflect reality. Uh, th this is Sujit Sanyal. I'm from ArcelorMittal, Long Products. I'm sorry? In, uh, in Contracar, Canada. Yes, sir. Uh, it was a very good presentation, Mr. Gonzalez. I like that. We produce 1.5 million tons of DRI in Contracar, as you know, and yes. we make 2 million tons of steel. So it's very heartening to see the future of, uh, of DRI. But I'm, about, I'm a little bit concerned about the availability of DR-grade pellets, because as you know, uh, DRI is, uh, should have low silica. And uh, what we see is that the availability of low silica pellets is uh, going down. And one alternative would be to do uh, beneficiation from the uh, existing uh, high silica iron ore uh, uh, grades. But that is very cost uh, effective. I mean, cost is very expensive projects. So, what are your thoughts? How do you, if, if in North America, let us say 50 million tons of steel is now converted to uh, uh, DRI EF based, then you require probably 80 million tons of uh, iron ore with very low silica. So, where do you get this uh, low silica iron ore pellets for DRI making? At this very point, we are in production, in regular production, of DR grade low silica, uh, DR grade pellets to our sole client uh, out of the, our North Shore mine in Minnesota. We know that we can produce a lot more. Uh, we also know that we can be competitive selling as we are selling. We're making money. We're not selling at a loss by any stretch of imagination but we can be a lot more competitive, competitive inside the Great Lakes. So when we put our first DRI facility in the Great Lakes, and then the second, and then the third, we are going to continue to grow our production of DR grade pellets in Minnesota. We are very confident that not only North Shore, but other iron bodies in the, in the state of Minnesota are extremely good to produce low silica DR grade pellets, very coarse ore, very easy to separate the silica flow chart extremely, uh, uh, flow sheet extremely uh, 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 friendly in terms of uh, uh, producing the pellets at very low cost. So no worries, we have the ability. We just need to have the first DRI facility in the Great Lakes. Good morning, Lorenzo. It's Corina from Modern Metals. How are you? Good, Maya. Um, Good morning. I have two small questions. One is, have you chosen a technology partner yet for the new plants, the DRI plants? I will give you a small answer. No, not okay. yet. Okay. Also, would you choose to build them near the mines or near maybe your largest uh, customer? My first preference is to build near the mine because that will shorten the, the freight between the, or the transportation logistics, if you will, between the, the pellet plant and the DRI facility. Because in the Great Lakes, Maya, if you are close to one client, you are gonna be far from a lot, a lot of other clients. And we have already identified at Cliffs uh, a, 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 a number of clients that already buy from sources like Venezuela that are not reliable by any stretch of imagination, already buying in a radius of 300 uh, miles, we can serve more than 50 clients. So the opportunity is right there, but we need to be close to the mine because we need to control costs. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So I'll try another one, please. We have the integrated steel mills, the United States and Canada under siege, Stelco, Algoma, and, and a number of the plants in the U.S., some of which are shut. What is Cleveland Cliffs able to do to enhance the survivability, improve the economic position, change the climate where your clients are not disappearing? That's a great question. I think we have been doing a lot. So I'll be glad to, to, to mention one by one. First of all, the current situation in terms of idle capacity in the United States among integrated is extremely uneven. We have one company that has two integrated plants uh, shut down at this point, and uh, that's what U.S. Steel with Fairfield and Granite City, and coincidentally, they are not our client, so we are not being affected by that. U.S. Steel is self-sufficient in pellets. So for the ones that are dependent on, on cliffs, we have a re-established long-term supply agreement with SR Algoma, it's our client. We have a very well-established, a great, mature, friendly, and very professional relationship with AK Steel, our great client, which I believe that we'll continue to grow business with Cliffs, and their decision to keep Ashland, the Ashland Blast Furnace shut down uh, is completely independent of what we can do for them, but we can do things, and we have been discussing, myself and Roger Newport, who is here, so thank you very much for being here for my presentation, Roger. So we continue to work together to create alternatives to bring uh, uh, Ashland Blast Furnace back, but ultimately, that's Roger's decision, and uh, no matter where he goes, I'll be very, very respectful, respectful and supportive. And the other one that has one blast furnace is ArcelorMittal. That's our largest client. We have just renewed a 10-year contract with ArcelorMittal in very good terms for both of us. It's a win-win partnership, and like all win-win partnerships, we first decided who would be the loser, and it's not going to be uh, Cliffs, it's not going to be uh, ArcelorMittal, and certainly it's not going to be any, uh, any of our, my other clients. So the ones that are not my clients are my, my competitors, especially the ones that recently are pounding their chest saying that they are going to compete with Cliffs. Come on, let's compete. I like that. Okay, so U.S. Steel is claiming they're going to get into the DRI pellet business. What's the impact on you, please? Nothing. Because I don't believe it. <laughs> I tend to do stuff. I tend not to talk about stuff. <laughs> I, I, I believe that the audience agrees with me. Okay, maybe the last question. Where, where are you getting your money, Lorenzo? <laughs> look, I, I should have... Look, I, I left Brazil in... October of 1997, I made the decision to come to the United States. I landed here in, in January 13, 1998, to stay one year. I'm still here uh, several, how many years? I don't even know anymore. 18 years later, I had no intention to go back after three months. I told my wife, we're not going back. We can sell our house in Brazil because we're not going back. And she agreed with me. So. You ask me where I'm going to make my money, it will still be here in the United States, running companies, creating business, preserving jobs, creating uh, 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 more opportunities for the steel business in the United States, making great friends, and we're not done. We have a lot to do. Money is just a consequence. Okay. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. <laughs>